Okay, so this segment focuses on the physiography or geomorphology of strike slip fault systems from the kilometer scale and above. And I'll just note up front that a lot of the examples I'll be, sh I'll be showing are from the San Andreas Fault in Southern California, um, partly because it's beautifully exposed in the California desert, but uh, mainly because it's where I grew up and where I've done a lot of work as a geologist over the years. So just fair warning um, that this lecture is a bit biased toward this particular system, but it's a good exemplary uh, system to study. So I want to start by showing you some videos from this really neat suite of analog experiments that were conducted in a geomorphology lab in Montpellier. This is a significant modification to the classic sandbox experiments in that the sand is built up to form uh, a zone of pre-existing topography. And there's a sprinkler system set up on the ceiling that simulates rainfall and associated runoff that can entrain sand particles and create depositional features. And meanwhile, the base of the sandbox is moved in a, a shear direction and simple shear to simulate uh, the development of a strike slip fault. And then topographic development, uh, depositional features and fault structures are all monitored using a laser interferometer and CCD cameras. It's kind of a neat um, setup. So here's an example of one of these experiments. Uh, the left is a zoom out of the whole sandbox and the right video, which I'll play after, is zoomed in on a segment of the fault in more detail. So you can see that the experiment um, includes both uh, deposition of uh, material driven by rainfall um, across the fault, but also the subsequent or simultaneous offset of those depositional features and also the pre-existing topographic features across the fault such that the more the fault slips, the more you start to develop this sort of linear uh, fault trace. Um, and the more there appears to be a mismatch between uh, the topography on uh, the sort of upstream part of the fault versus the downstream part. Let's look in a little more detail now, playing the video on the right. And this one will sort of pause to show you the structures that form. So right now there's no right lateral shear. This is just the depositional features, the beginning of the shear component. There's the early uh, fractures that form. We'll talk about those in a moment. Those are weedle shears. And uh, you can see new deposits coming down and crossing the fault and wiping out its trace locally, but then rapidly the trace reforms as uh, the right lateral slip continues. You can see that some of these features are now being sort of offset. Some of the downstream um, drainages are being offset from their upstream sources. But a lot of times those um, drainages will actually start to curve in a right lateral sense so they continue to accommodate uh, deposition and, and uh, fluid flow, um, but uh, they're substantially offset. They're sort of a, an L shape. So here's a sketch of the types of structures that were being produced in those analog models. The Riedel shears R and R prime represent conjugate faults formed at 30 degrees from sigma one, perhaps you remember this relationship um, from structural geology. And then in the compression direction, much like thrust faults, strike slip faults can form these sort of duplex-like structures where slices are repeated uh, and stacked. And eventually though, all of these smaller scale features will link up to form a discrete linear uh, fault trace that is parallel to uh, the fault boundary. And then the interaction between these structures developing along the fault and the topographic and depositional features um, can produce a whole host of interesting morphological features that are characteristic of strike slip falls. Here's a cartoon showing most of these features and um, their sort of terminology. I won't be going through all of these, but many, many of them are self-explanatory, but I'll highlight um, a few with examples um, in subsequent slides. <clears throat> 
So here's one example that I imagine at least some of you have seen images of in previous classes. This is a section of the San Andreas Fault in the Carrizo Plain, in Central California. This data set is high resolution LIDAR. And you can see very clearly the fault trace itself and several associated offset drainages. And I'll just note this is a very arid region, part of the Mojave Desert in California. So these drainages host water only during major storms or flash floods. So they lend themselves quite well to being uh, preserved over long time scales. If we superimpose topographic contours and labels, um, you can ignore the, the blue numbers and just focus on the other colored features. Um, the orange colors show offset channels, meaning drainages that are offset, but not necessarily abandoned. Whereas the pink colors show channels that are referred to as abandoned or beheaded because they're no longer connected to their host channel upstream. Then the bluish purple color shows a, a local depression along the fault produced due to offset topography, which has formed a small pond known as a sag pond. And then the green is showing linear ridges, uh, which can form due to offset topography, but also due to local fault uplift uh, between fault strands that form a sort of transpressional um, area. Not all strikes of faults are quite as stark as the San Andreas in the desert, of course, but even in highly vegetated regions, their surface expressions can be very prominent. This is the Alpine Fault in New Zealand. This is two images of the same part of the fault, but viewed uh, from opposite directions. You can see it forms a very prominent scarp where there are sharp mismatches in topography. There are sag ponds on either side of the fault here. There are distinct uh, right laterally offset channels here. And there's a prominent structurally controlled um, saddle between the two pieces of uh, offset topography um, shown there. Returning to the San Andreas, um, this is a region in what's called the Coachella Valley, where there are several fault strands. But this strand in particular, known as the Banning Fault, um, cuts across this prominent canyon, Whitewater Canyon. And there was a LIDAR data set collected in 2006. And if you strip away the vegetation from it, you can see the trace of the Banning Fault very clearly as small scarps that are exactly orthogonal to sort of the downstream uh, little drainages. You can see those developed even through the active alluvial plain associated with the White Robin River here. So the red arrow, for example, shows a fault scarp in the canyon itself. And then the blue arrow shows a fault scarp and offset drainages uh, within the canyon walls. An interesting thing about the San Andreas in this region is that it clearly traps water, uh, forming springs and leading to the formation of oases, like this prominent cluster of vegetation uh, here in Whitewater Canyon. This is normally a quite arid uh, desert environment, but all along the strands, multiple strands of the San Andreas Fault here, uh, the fault is decorated by these oases. And this is pretty much the only part of California that contains native palm trees that occupy these oases. And they form these linear traces that divine, define several strands of the San Andreas through here. The oases have a long history of having hosted Native American tribes, and they're one of the main reasons that uh, humans were able to live in this desert environment um, historically. Now, of course, there are giant desert cities, as you can see in the picture on the left. These are big resort cities that drain water uh, from the Colorado River, uh, which is quite a source of controversy in California, but an unrelated issue. The reason water becomes trapped along the fault is likely because the fault has accumulated a lot of damage in the form of pulverized rock and fault gouge that uh, consists of clay minerals and clay-sized particles that can act as a permeability barrier. So those are some examples of just the general linear morphologies that define the traces of continental strikes of faults. Let's talk a little bit now about the different types of offset features that develop along them. We already discussed this example of offset stream channels. This is probably the most common and prominent example. But it's also somewhat common for strikes of faults to offset depositional rather than erosional features as well. So for example, alluvial fans, these can be deposited and then shoveled in a strike slip sense such that their axes are no longer pointing uh, to the upstream source from which they were deposited. 
uh, and you can use these then to estimate the amount of slip that's accumulated over time by sort of reconstructing the alluvial fan access to its upstream drainage source. Here's a large scale example from the Southern San Andreas, uh, not quite as simple as the cartoon on the last slide, but it's just illustrating this prominent alluvial fan uh, shown in blue here labeled T2 uh, that's offset by uh, two separate uh, strands of the San Andreas, one of which you can see has somewhat of a dip slip component because the alluvial fan is offset both um, in a vertical direction and a lateral one. Here's another smaller scale example of a suite of several offset um, alluvial fans. If you turn on the sort of uh, geology there, there are in fact four small alluvial fans that are displaced a few tens of meters in this case. Terrace risers are also um, somewhat common offset features. These are uh, the margins of offset channels, but then also the floodplain around them that forms a nice uh, planar surface, and those can get offset over time um, and uh, eventually used to restore slip. So you may be wondering why we spend so much time characterizing the geomorphology of strike slip faults. Um, they're interesting to look at, of course, but it turns out that their primary importance lies in the fact that they lend themselves very well to quantifying the long-term geologically constrained rate of slip on faults. In other words, they're more suited um, to understanding changes in rates of slip on faults than any other faulting type, for example, normal or thrust faults, just because of the clearly delineated um, lateral offsets. And this means that they provide us with opportunities to test how fault slip rates vary within a fault system uh, from fault to fault and also on individual faults along strike and also how slip rates vary uh, within a fault system over different time scales from the short term decadal time scales captured by geodesy to the longer term millennial time scales or, or several million year time scales. And what allows us to do this is the development of multiple quaternary geochronometers, especially over the last 20 years or so, that permit us to date the timing of deposition and or stabilization of geomorphic features. And there are multiple methods we can talk more about uh, during class, if you like, including cosmogenic dating, uh, optically stimulated luminescence, radiocarbon, and the example I'm showing here is U-series dating on pedogenic carbonate, which was used to date the offset alluvial fans along the San Andreas in this image that I showed you earlier. So this is rinds of carbonate that precipitate around the bottom of class of especially arid region alluvial deposits once they've stabilized and started to form a crude soil. So hence the term pedogenic carbonate here. And you can scrape off bits of those carbonate rinds and date them uh, with uranium series methods. <clears throat> In this case, it told us the alluvial fans that were offset here were around 3.5 thousand years old. And that combined with a measured offset of 50 meters gave us a slip rate of around uh, 14 millimeters per year, per year for this uh, strand of the San Andreas Fault. So this is quite a powerful tool that provides us more detail and discrimination of slip rates than can be resolved with, uh, say, decadal scale geodetic methods. Just as some more uh, context for this, when you look at slip rates compiled uh, for this region on a more base and wide scale, for example, you can see an interesting pattern where strands of the San Andreas appear to be losing slip as they change strike uh, and bend toward the Northwest. So there's relatively fast slip in the slip rate sites on the Southeast section of this image, the one labeled Bisker Palms uh, and Q1 Debris Cone. The slip rates on San Andreas fault strands there are at least 10 millimeters per year, but then that's contrasted with the less than five millimeter per year uh, slip rates so measured over similar time scales in uh, the northwest section um, of, of the fault in what's termed the San Gorgonio Pass uh, region. So it suggests that this tangled mess of faults in the San Gorgonio Pass region is somewhat of a 
a structural knot, so to speak, that ruptures propagate into from the southeast and then die out um, instead of propagating through the structural complexity. And if we zoom out even more and examine geologic slip rates on either side of this San Gregonio Pass structural knot area, we see that the San Andreas actually on both sides has much faster slip rates. So this suggests that not only do earthquakes nucleating in the southeast and propagating northwest basically die out when they reach the San Gregorio Pass structural complexity, but also earthquakes in the northwest that are propagating southeast also die out in uh, the San Gregorio Pass complexity. So this provides a lot of assistance in um, seismic hazard forecasting when people try to assess the future behavior of major San Andreas earthquakes and how far they're likely to propagate and which cities and communities will be most impacted. And all of this information is constrained from offset geomorphic features that people have located and, and then been able to date uh, along the fault. So the last part of this lecture, let's just jump up a little bit in scale <clears throat> and go through some of the regional scale features that characterize strike slip fault complexity along strike. I think uh, some of this will be review for many of you from structural geology. So I've already shown you examples such as the ones on the last couple of slides of where strike slip faults are not perfectly straight or planar single strands, but they're often multiple strands, each of which can be curved or exhibit significant bending. These steps and bends in strike slip faults cause changes in the kinematics, uh, switches to transpression or transtension, depending on the bending or step over orientations and the sense of shear on the fault. And so focusing on the example of dextral faults again, uh, a right step or bend in a dextral fault will result in transtension and the development of oblique normal faults and pull apart basins whereas a left step in a dextral fault will result in transpression and oblique reverse or thrust faults forming zones of uplift or, or mountain ranges. In cross section, these oblique slip regions may form flower structures um, with positive flower structures in the case of transpression, sort of squeezing things upward and negative flower structures in uh, the case of transtension. Here's another sandbox model movie that I that I like. It shows the development and evolution of some of these features um, associated with transpression, transpression, um, transpression, and transtension along the strikes of fault. And it includes how uh, a description of how once some of these basins and contractional uplift zones form, they can then later be sheared internally as they're dragged along the fault uh, with subsequent uh, strike slip. It also includes a sort of erosional component in the model, mostly just consisting of sand grains rolling down um, from the uplifted areas. But this allows you to see some of the internal architecture um, of these structures uh, by looking down on them in that view. There will also be cross sections through the sandbox um, that are uh, interesting. So I'll play this for about five minutes. And since it's annotated with text, I'll, I'll refrain from uh, narrow, narrating it uh, too much. So this first part will just be, yeah, this high speed preview, and then it'll go through it in more detail um, after seeing the preview. <clears throat> 
that's an important point here that they make that uh, these faults are too steep to just be thrust faults. Their oblique slip uh, strikes the faults with um, a thrust component. Okay, so I think I'll stop the movie there, but um, I hope that uh, helps illustrate some of the ways in which um, these trans tensional and transpressional uh, features form along strike slip faults. So to look now at a couple of regional scale examples of these, uh, the Dead Sea transform is a classic example of the transtensional basin, or really two of them. Um, and this area represents two uh, left stepovers in a right lateral fault, which leads to extensional basin development in the stepover zones. Uh, these extensional basins are, of course, prominent sediment depot centers, uh, also salt basins and regions of oil shales and petroleum uh, exploration. But of course, back to the San Andreas, um, many of you have likely heard of the Big Bend in the San Andreas, which we already looked at to some extent. It's where the fault system bends from northwest striking to west striking and back again in and south of uh, the Los Angeles region. And this, of course, produces mountain ranges that are uh, up to about 3,500 meters in elevation, known as the transverse ranges. The highest mountain range is the San Bernardino Mountains with uh, Mount San Gorgonio. That's where the San Gorgonio Pass structural knot uh, that I discussed earlier is located. It's right at that southeastern start of uh, the Big Bend area. But really the entire fault system in uh, the region of the Big Bend is a structural knot. Uh, this is a three-dimensional fault model of faults in Southern California from uh, the Southern California Earthquake Center, and it also shows cumulative seismicity over several decades. And you can see just the incredible complexity of uh, the fault patterns or the fault system here. The San Andreas itself is shown in red, but then it has many um, sort of subsidiary faults within the system shown in white, many of which are thrust faults that are bounding uh, the base of uh, transverse range uh, uplift structures mountain ranges, basically. The Alpine Fault is also a zone of transpressional strike slip, especially at its uh, northeastern termination. Uh, the transpression is, is partly related to um, a small left step over in the fault, in, in, in the right lateral fault, uh, but more directly simply due to its interaction with uh, the Hickerangi subduction margin and its function as a trench-trench uh, transform. Uh, these interactions with the Hickerangi uh, subduction margin and the Alpine strike slip fault were beautifully exemplified in the 2016 uh, Kaikoura earthquake that ruptured about 15 different fault strands all associated with the Alpine fault and Hickerangi margin. And in case anyone was unsure of the transpressional nature of the fault system here, this incredible fault scarp shown in the photo on the right formed during that earthquake and it really hammers home the point that there's a strong uh, oblique component. It's, a th it's about a three to four meter vertical wall. You can see people wearing orange jackets there for scale, um, but this vertical offset actually pales in contrast to the strike slip component, which was up to 17 meters uh, in some places. This was really an amazing and complex um, earthquake sequence.
So I'll leave you with the summary and summary figure in case it's useful. Um, and the final module in this lecture segment will be a short one on some enigmatic aspects of strike slip systems. Thanks for your attention.